internship to have so lots of our ISM course, which is our information storage and management course. But before we kind of dive into that, I'm just going to give you kind of a brief um, introduction as to kind of the background behind the program um, and kind of the you know, thought process behind it. And then um, I'll talk to you about some new courses we've added to our program, but the focus is really going to be to get you into the partnership with us. Um, Support that they have with their net lab products for the labs that we're going to be piloting and officially rolling out probably around the summer. So, Rich, do you have anything you want to add right now? No, just tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably a lot of you know Rich. I have a lot of new faces here. A few of you I think I've met before, but um, a lot of new faces, which is great. So, um, you, Grace, do you have the slides to come up? Great, we'll start there. <laughs> So, um, ENC has been doing a study for the last five years about the growth of digital information. I think all of this can realize is happening in a lot, and IT has been driven by the growth of data. Um, and so, if we think back to about two, well, it's 2012, I can't believe it, three years ago, right? We're talking about 0.18 zettabytes of data, and it's growing by a factor of 44, so basically 35 zettabytes by um, 2020. So really when we factor it in, it's growing about, um, doubling about once every two years. So that's a lot of data. So it's really created a lot of how do we manage all of this data, how do we secure it, how do we protect it, all of these things that are come up. And because of that, about five years ago, EMC launched our academic alliance to say how can we help schools, college, universities better educate students about the growth of data and protecting it, securing it, whatnot. Great. Sorry, I don't have my normal little clicker. Mm -hmm. um, so what's driving that growth of digital information? Well, I think it's pretty apparent when there's no Web 2.0 applications, right? I mean, they estimate about 50 billion photos or create, you know, digital photos every year. About three terabytes of um, photos are uploaded to Facebook every day. So it just kind of goes to show you kind of like the phenomenal growth. Um, ubiquitous content generating device. I mean, we've seen that with, you know, our iPods and our iPads and all of those content, like today, you know, with our, even just our mobile devices, our iPhones, so much content, text, video, photos, you name it. I mean, it's just coming from all types of devices. You know, the new Amazon, Kindle, right? All of these devices have so much data that's created. Um, longer data retention periods, no surprise. HIPAA, Starbucks, Oxley, all of those things mean that companies have to keep data over longer periods of time. And they have regulations about how long they have to keep it. Um, Obviously, for you know, like thinking of healthcare, I mean, your records are kept for you know, until you a few years, if not even after you die. I wouldn't be surprised if they keep those now. I mean, I don't know about all of you. When I go to the doctor's office now, she just brings everything up online, which is amazing. All of your records, your prescriptions, all of that, anything they want to print out, right there in her office. Uh, and then secure collaboration. Obviously, everybody's working so remote these days that no matter where you're at, at home at the office, but not you want to have secure collaboration, that only the people that should have access to that data are the ones that have access and can get in. Uh, so really, with this growth of data, I mean, uh, we know that everything's evolving, right, in the industry today. It's not just you have one server, one application. It's really about having more of IT as a service. I'm sure all of you have heard that term with cloud computing. EMC has really been driving to evolve with the infrastructure. And so before, you know, IT needs to now be run and built differently, right? Before, we have sort of multiple independent operations, kind of that one um, one application, one server, um, as you, you have to keep adding to that infrastructure that's very costly. Um, why has IT changed? Well, that's very costly. It's not just with buying the application, you know, buying the servers. It's the space. It's the power and cooling. It's all of those things that have caused companies is just not very saleable long term, especially as the data continues to grow and grow and people aren't necessarily getting rid of data. Um, and so really now, as we see the transformation, they want it to be more highly integrated, minimal you know, inventory, just much more streamlined, right? And it's really being driven more by business needs, I think, what we see is what, this is what businesses are demanding. And it also needs to be consumed and governed differently, right? So really before, it's just very costly, right? Each business unit having this cost. They just can't manage it very well, and it's, just, it's harder to back up, it's harder to secure all of those things. So now afterwards, it's much more self-provisioning, you know, really driven by, hey, I have, I mean, they can get servers up now in a virtual environment very easily, right, to deploy an application, whereas before that could take weeks 
for them to do. And so that's where we see this transformation, right? The classic data center, all of this infrastructure, each like startup would buy and have to buy, like have networks, have computers, servers, whatnot. Companies starting up today now don't necessarily have to in invest in an infrastructure. They can go and pay for it as a service. They may have to have the app, you know, the initial devices to log on, but now it's really affordable for them. They're only paying for what they need. But if we see companies like EMC, we take our own self as an example. We have a classic data center. Well, EMC has already virtualized all of our data centers, meaning, you know, we've gone from like, you know, hundreds of servers down to like 80 servers, right? So that's kind of the first step is to really go and virtualize the infrastructure and have a virtualized data center. So it's much more easy. That's, that's sort of phase one is dealing with that infrastructure. Phase two that we see kind of combined with that is really being able to deploy the applications much more seamlessly for the business, much more quickly if they have a new need, a new business unit needs to have a new application they need. And then, then the third kind of phase is really having the idea of the service of the cloud, right? And I think the easiest example I've heard someone say is like going to the gym. Right? When we get home, you don't have all this equipment necessarily to treadmill all the weights, right? It's a lot for you to maintain, right? And you can just pay and you go to the gym and you use their equipment. It's very easy. I mean, it's just a very easy analogy, I think, of how kind of IT is evolving. And it's really being driven by cost and, and man, you know, all of that. At, at the end of the day, it's just too cost prohibitive for people. And they can really be more logical and more flexible. Um, and where you see today, and this might be kind of hard to see here, but you can see this today in about 24 months. Like, so if you look at this is kind of a classic data center, the 53%, well, in 24 months, it's going to go down to 36%. People are continuing that transition. The blue is a virtualized server environment, kind of that first step that companies take. 36%, it'll be up to 45. And then C2, this one here is the, uh, the traditional, the private cloud, and this is the external cloud. So private meaning that companies are creating their own private clouds. Right? They're not necessarily going out using Amazon or Google. I mean, if you're a hospital, are you going to go out and put all of your data on the public cloud? Probably not, because the biggest issue is people have is security. Right? So they're going to just do it internally, so they have control and management over it. But it's much more flexible and still much more um, cost effective for them. Um, but a lot of companies, what we start seeing them do is outsourcing certain pieces of their business using maybe a public cloud or a service provider. You're going to really start to see that, right? Like AT&T, all those big service providers will be providing those types of um, services to companies. And so kind of EMC has done a study the last um, five years as well where we go out and we um, basically survey about 1,600 IT managers and we say, what are your biggest challenges around the growth of digital information? And the number one challenge is always managing that growth of data, right? Um, but really one, I kind of didn't want to focus too much on what those top ten are, but like what's the impact to the skill set? Okay, and I kind of liken what's happening with cloud computing and that evolution and, and the transformation of the architecture to what happened with voice over IT about ten plus years ago. The voice guys didn't know data, and the data guys didn't know voice right, and so now there had to be this cross-training, right? Um, and I think that's what's, that's what's happening with the cloud infrastructure, is that network of folks now need to understand virtualized server environments and storage, and the same with on um, the server, you know, that data admins. They really have to understand much more of what the other specialties are. It doesn't mean they have to be a specialist in it, but they need to understand how everything interacts and operates. Um, and so when we asked that, we said, okay, what's the impact to your systems group? Meaning how qualified do you think your systems folks are with the adoption of virtualized the cloud computing? And they said that, you know, it's a high impact, about 14% of them, and 38% is a moderate impact. So if you combine those, it's about 50%. Same with their storage group. What is the impact, right? Um, I know even with EMC's curriculum, a lot of it being all of our storage and our, you know, hardware, large storage array products, is that more and more server, server virtualization, the whole concept is built into that. So you're going to really need to be able to understand it at, with, within those courses. Um, and then same with the network group. So this just kind of shows you kind of what's happening in the industry and how, um, you know, qualified do the current IT managers think their team are and what kind of rescaling or education will they need. Uh, and I just, these, if you're, I just did a quick search on some of these, like for job roles. If you go out there now and you start searching, here's like the junior network admin one, support of math environment, VMware experience, obviously security. But you're starting to see this. This is just showing you evidence of what people are asking for in a lot of these job roles. And then there's one more on the next one. I just pulled two out so you can kind of see them. 
Oh, I didn't know. So here, like VMware, ESXi, and SAM technology. And there's a lot of other skills, obviously. But just if you go out and you search, I kind of focus on network um, because with the ISM course, what we find is it's a really nice follow-on to people who've done Cisco, CCNA, like it's just you need that basic networking knowledge and server knowledge before you can really understand the storage and networking on the back end. So I focus on those with job role. So really quickly about our academic alliance program, it's been around for five years. Like I said, we started with information storage and management because there was a storage knowledge skill gap. EMC was really struggling to hire people, our customers and our partners were, because they come out and they just don't understand storage, they don't know about storage. And I think it was more specialized before, more enterprise. But, you know, that's changed. I mean, every small business, all of us carry some kind of storage device now. Um, and all small businesses probably have some type of NAS file storage. Uh, so that's changed. So this is still kind of like the key course, but we've actually added, uh, we just made an announcement at the end of the year, we've added a cloud infrastructure and services course, a data science and big data analytics will be coming out beginning of this year, and backup recovery systems and architecture. So we've gone from one course to four, and all of these are technology-based, meaning they're not specific to EMC. So our goal isn't like to, tr I mean, the products are so expensive on EMC and the infrastructure, not to train you on our products, but to get the students really educated about the foundation layer. Of, uh, in these areas, and from a technology perspective. Uh, this is just a quick overview. Anybody who's interested in these courses and the outlines, the ISM course um, that we're going to be focusing on, um, can you just build it? There's just one. That's kind of the focus of what Rich and I should come out with like a red. Oh. This is going to be like the focus of what Rich and I are going to talk about. The labs that are coming out with NDG, which are scalable. Um, if you're already doing Cisco, you're already doing VMware, it's really using the VMware um, IT Academy. Um, set up so it's scalable. Um, if we try to say, hey, you have to buy hardware, it's not scalable, right? It's one student, one time on a machine. It, you can't afford that. You can't invest in that. But if we use the VMware virtual machine infrastructure and we use some open source tools like OpenFiler and FreeNAS, now it's very affordable, right? If um, you have the servers and you're doing and you have, you know, the VMware. So that's going to be the focus. So this we have a book for from Wiley. So if anybody's interested in a copy of that book, Happy to give you a complimentary copy of that, of that curriculum. But these are just a snapshot of what's going to be covered in the other courses. Um, we look at cloud. This edition is if a student has the networking knowledge and they have the storage and the server knowledge, then this kind of builds on that. This is the whole change in the architecture, right? You kind of have to understand those other pillars um, with this course. Um, and they all do tie to certifications, um, EMC certifications. And the nice thing is this whole program is free to school. You get that if you join. Uh, for the EMC, you get, you know, the free curriculum, all the PowerPoints, like, you know, the course. It's all of our commercial course, all the same content, free training, um, and uh, so there's no cost to you. Obviously, there's the cost of your time and energy <laughs> to get scale. So this just kind of covers those courses. You get a snapshot. If you are interested in becoming a member, I have a few of my partners here, so I see two of them, um, and they at the end want to say anything, but we just have an online application. You go, I mean, the key thing is you have to be an academic institution. This is why it's free to you. Um, they think that you're going to pick at least one of the courses you want to teach and deliver. Um, basically, I'm going to teach the course and administer the program. We do, for ISM, I haven't changed it yet, but there's a five-day online synchronous training we do, but we also have video out, he's self-paced. The cloud course is all self-paced, so there's no instruction. It's all on your own. The backup and recovery and the data science probably will have others. But this, the cloud course that EMC rolled out in training is really designed to be scalable for really addressing the larger audience. So there's not a lot of cloud-type training out there. Um, and then um, we have a faculty, private faculty community where you download everything once you join. It has all the resources, you know, quizzes, use cases, videos, PowerPoints, all of that. Then you promote it, and then you teach it. Sounds really simple. So you're like, do I need it? Sounds so simple. One, two, three, four, five, six, and you're ready to go. <laughs> I know it's not that simple. Um, yes? So the curriculum is already there. It doesn't have to be developed. So. Correct. It's all, um, it's like basically taken our commercial course and are making it available to you for free. So you get all the, like a student guide. So the ISM, we have the book. That's out in the public, you know, domain. Um, but then once you join, you get the PowerPoints, the training, the quizzes, all those kind of instructor materials you would get in an instructor edition is what we give you when you join. So we try to make it very easy if it meets your needs so you're not having to invest a lot. 
I mean, you have to invest your time and energy depending on what your area of expertise is. So I think that's the last slide there. Some other resources. I'll, I can either just, like, Rich kind of jump in and talk about the ISM labs, um, but then maybe we save questions for the end. And then if you have, um, I know Bill and uh, is here too, so I feel like I said I have a few professors here. Um, if you have some questions that have, Bill's been teaching it for a number, uh, it's been going on at Orange Coast for a number of years, so the ISM course. So. Thank you guys for your service. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's kind of exciting. You got a standing on only room crowd here. I'm a little intimidated. This is great. So as soon as Grace gets my prezzo up here, what I'm going to do <laughs> is uh, present an online lab environment that's basically a VDI environment. Many of you may already be familiar with it. I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. If you're familiar with the Cisco Networking Academy, anyone? Any hands? Few? About half. Okay, that's great. So uh, NetLab is a remote lab appliance. In other words, it's a client that can be shipped to your academic institution so you can host and manage a training environment. Traditionally, we supported the Cisco Networking Academy program, so you can rack and stack routers, switches, firewalls behind that lab, and then your students could be anywhere on the internet um, to access those routers and switches. Here, it's that one. That's it. Thank you. And if you can leave that there for me so I can. Thank you. All right. So, what we are doing basically in this lab environment is creating a manageable portal for your students to be anywhere on the internet so they can do real training, accessing routers, switches, and firewalls. Well, a couple of years ago, about two years ago, VMware Corporation came to us and said, can you do the same thing for a virtual environment and set it up so the students can learn not only how to operate and access a VDI environment, but configure virtual machines themselves and manage VMware's ESXi products and vCenter so they can earn their install, configure, and manage course VCP cert. So that's the course you have to take to earn your VCP. It's required by VMware. So what we did was we went off and built that environment for, for VMware so that now you can have a NetLab system set up to run real Cisco equipment and a VDI environment so that it's managing virtual machines. Now the first question I often get is why in the world would I want this front end appliance in front of my VDI environment. Well, when you pass out virtual machines, what are a couple of things you've got to do if you're trying to teach the students? They've got the virtual machine, they're accessing from home, what are they doing? Concept, right? The VM alone is not of a lot of value, right? Because what are you going to do? You've just got a fancy computer that's been virtualized, but you've got to marry it to content. What's another thing you need to do? Got to read baseline and provide responses. There you go. That's it. So you've got to figure out a way to manage all those VMs and then marry them to a student and marry it to content. Now on top of that, what's another thing you start to run into when you build your own VDI environment? What's the biggest headaches that you probably do? Like if you're in cybersecurity or if you're in general IT, where do you really start to struggle when you deploy VDI environments? When you want to marry more than one VM, right? You want to start connecting multiple VMs together to create networked environments. So that's where we're trying to focus is help solve many of those problems that schools run into as they deploy. Now, this concept's not new. Um, we've been doing this for about 12 years, and the map kind of gives you a feel for deployments around the world. So this is not a new thing you're seeing. It's being done for a long time. Um, here are the, the programs that we support today. We support the Cisco Networking Academy, VMware IT Academy. We're working in cybersecurity. We're trying to figure out how to help in this area. We're working with an NSF organization called Cassia. There's also two gentlemen in the room that I hope they don't mind I'll point them out. Casey O'Brien over here and then Dan Manson. Um, they are working on cyber competitions and they're using our product to do cyber competitions. Are uh, you guys present today? Yeah, they're doing really cool stuff, so you might want to visit with them. So there's a lot of work going on in cybersecurity. But for lab content, we're working with Cassia. And then we're adding labs for storage course, um, working with Kim's program, the EMC Academic Alliance. So as I mentioned, we're very popular with Cisco Network Academy. So if you've already got NetLab, and the reason I've got this up here, if you've got NetLab today for the Cisco Networking Academy, all those courses that I just highlighted, they can be ported to your system. They can be pushed out to your system and you can set up this environment so that you can use your existing NetLab. If you're a Cisco Academy, you're used to these type of real physical equipment topologies, 
And we can't virtualize this because we don't have the legal rights to virtualize iOS. Makes sense. You've got to use real gear. Well, we're going to go from this real gear environment to a virtual environment where we can clone the virtual machines and you can assign the virtual machine to each individual student so they can own it for the entire semester. Okay? Now, if you have this Cisco set up today, this one equipment topology is in 200 labs across about 10 different courses. So there's a lot of bang for the buck horizontally as you go across all the different courses if you want to set up this environment. We're also supporting the CLEC voice over IP. So there's, there's a whole wide variety of things you'll be able to do. The VMware IT Academy program that I mentioned, this is what's really opening the door for the virtualization. VMware has asked us to partner with them so that academic institutions can host their own VDI environment. Now, this is an example of a virtual topology. This virtual topology maps to the VMware Certified Professional course, Install, Configure, Manage, so your students get their VCT. These five virtual machines can be assigned to each individual student. So I can assign each of you your own topology, and then you can go home, and from your campus, you can access your VMs, and these would be only your virtual machines. So just like what you do in a job, you would configure these computers. Does that make any sense? The concept kind of, yeah? All right, great. Now, that cybersecurity lab environment that I mentioned earlier, if you wanted to, you could stand up a research environment where you created a unique topology. Maybe you only use the Microsoft client, and maybe you wanted to add a sandbox, and maybe you wanted to add something else. You could determine and create your own custom topologies. And that's what's happening with the cybersecurity sector. Casey, Dan, Eric Spangler, you know Eric, they're creating a research and development art environment so that their students and other schools are working collaboratively with them on cybersecurity efforts. So you can do that if you so choose. Now, for EMC, and that's what we're all here focused on right now, is EMC has a really good course that's back to the curriculum, a book. Um, it's called Information Storage Management that Kim mentioned earlier. And one of the challenges they had was many of the professors and students were saying, this is great, it gives us an introduction, but we want some hands-on experience. You know, they actually want to be able to actually log in and maybe create a SAN, maybe use OpenFiler to create a storage area network environment, then set up the LUNs and set up RAID and set up all the different storage things they're learning about. So what we've done is we've gone off and created a library, an outline of labs, to map to the curriculum that EMC offers for this course. Now, I'm very interested in your feedback. You guys are teaching. So you know what your students are interested in. You know what companies in your community are saying they want to learn. We want to give your students hands-on experience so that they can install OpenFiler and set up a virtual machine as a SAM. And that's what our first lab will do. We want to set up RAID and to introduce your students to RAID, LUNs, et cetera, as you go through this. Now, these 10 labs are what we've outlined with EMC to map to their ISM course. Now, I got a question for you. How many folks up there would rather go ahead and log in to a lab and do these labs? Do a lab right now. Anybody? Cool. All right. So this is a little dangerous. The reason this is a little dangerous is I can't go around and test all these computers. I just got in here this morning. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what your computer is set up to, to allow, like if it has job enable, what ports are open. But if you raise your hand, and I'm going to ask you to raise it again, I've got about 10 accounts that I'm going to pass out. And you'll actually be able to do a lab while I sit up here and go blah, blah, blah. And if you don't want to do a lab, look over the shoulder and watch one of your peers do it. All right, so the URL is going to be netlab.netdevgroup.com. <laughs> the username is going to be stud, short for student, stud1 through a certain number. And I'm going to go down as we raise hands and I'm going to pass them out. The password is going to be emc12345. Now, again, I got 12, so I'm going to space it. So I'm going to ask one more time. Everybody raise your hand if you want to be the, the person doing the last. Keep your hands up for a second, okay? Anybody on the back row do one? Anybody? Back row? No? All right. Rick Watson, the VMware instructor, will do one. No, I'm not going to let you rip first. One, two, three, four, five. Keep your hands up, please. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. Okay, I've got twelve accounts. Here's how I'm going to do it. Um, you guys here stud one. Please. Size is going to be log in. Okay. Will you please use stud two? Use stud three. Student three. Uh, use student four. Share among the three of you, please. 
Um, hmm. Actually, could you do, ma'am, would you mind being so I can look at your screen? Yeah, I mean, all right. So that was step four. Nextstep.com. The username is stud, and then the number I gave you. All right. And then the password is EMC12345. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you all to do me a favor. During this presentation, Recording started. I know death by PowerPoint is no fun. <laughs> so I'm not looking to bore the heck out of you guys. Did you want to do a lap? Oh, okay. I thought you raised your hand. Okay. Rick, if you want to use that 12. Okay. All righty. So I'm going to log in here. And if you're not doing the lab, what you can do is follow along with me. Also, the lights down up front. Yeah, I can. Light up that we can't yeah, I know. It's hard to see that. All right. Everybody in the room has. All right. So, who wants complete darkness? Raise your hand if you want complete darkness. All right. Brightness. Sorry, guys. All right, that was easy. Okay, I'm logged into an instructor account. Everybody else is logged into a student account. A student does not have a lot of power. All you can do is schedule a lab and do a lab. An instructor can mentor the students. So, guess what? While you're doing the lab, I can join you on the lab and access your VM, and everybody else can see you type. So I could do that and blow it up on the screen. If that intimidates anybody, you see me on your on your student lab environment, raise your hand, I'll get off yours and go to somebody else's, okay? Because my my tip is not to drive anybody crazy. My tip is to show you the power of a VDI environment. Now what we're doing here is we're scheduling access to limited resources. How many schools that you know of can rack and stack all the equipment they want before they run out of budget? Anybody got that situation? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. So what we're trying to do is timeshare a couple of servers. So we're timesharing the CPU and the RAM of the servers so you can schedule a class or a student and be guaranteed you're going to have access to that CPU and RAM, just like we would timeshare a router or a switch. Pretty cool, huh? Because you're no longer on an on-demand model because when you're in an on-demand model, what happens? At a certain point, your servers or your server farm screens local. And then you're having add another server, add another server. So what schools told us is they couldn't pull off that model. So we created a model where you could rack and stack two to four servers and then pass out virtual machines through that environment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump on to pod two, lab, pardon me, lab two, pod one. I'm going to use this as an example. Notice this is a topology. This is a real, these are real computers. Guys, anybody that's out there, what you can do, jump on to your inner lab button if you've logged in. Lab 2, one. Okay. Let's finish you got on the screen. Okay. You can do either lab you want. Let's see. Oh, okay. I got it. I got it. Um, all right. There's two, there's two pods. Let's see. What I would like you to do is do lab two pod, lab two. Look on the list and it says lab two. Do lab two. Okay. All right? Whatever. Yeah. If you do not have lab two listed, do okay. lab one. Okay, and then lab two pod two. Yeah. All right. All right. Now once you get into the environment, you're going to see the little computers. All right? Just like I've got up on my screen. And then I can click on the button that says show lab content. And that lab content is actually the steps that you're going to follow to do the lab exercise. Okay? So if you'll notice here, I've got a show lab content button. All right. I click on that. I'm going to pull up a PDF. You might want to resize your window so you can have the lab exercise right beside you. All right. And then I'm going to scroll down and start following the steps. I'll look. If you'll notice, you got an introduction. You've got your objectives for the for the lab. All right. 
And then it shows the topology so the student understands he's matched the right topology, your lab settings. Notice what's really important in step four. I got lab settings like passwords, usernames, real important stuff. Okay? Then I've got, when I get into task one, I'm actually really doing real stuff. This is the point I'm going to start creating a RAID partition. Okay? No, I skipped ahead and did lab two. I'm going to go back and show lab one in a second. Lab one actually sets up open filer as a real SAN. So you, you start creating a virtual machine that's going to look like a SAN, a storage area network device. All right, I got a question. How many people am I boring to death? Anyone? Raise your hand. I won't worry about feelings. I really won't. I won't be offended. How many people think this is cool? Only five people? Holy cow, guys. Let me go do something else. I got a company to run. I'll go somewhere else. All right, who thinks this is really cool? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, there's some more hands. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back home, guys. I can order money. Let me turn it. Um, that's the hardware requirement. Right now, what I'm trying to do is just get those that want to try out a lab going with these draft labs so you can try it out. Um, in, a, in a few minutes, I'll go over the actual hardware requirements to set up this environment at your school. Keep in mind, you don't have to buy this environment. For example, Dan has a NetLab system sitting on the couch. If Dan chose to set up this course, he could share with a couple other schools. So if you want to work with somebody who's really savvy about getting grants and collaborate with Dan on cybersecurity and other courses, talk to Dan. Other people might have a NetLab. Like, if you got a NetLab, you can share that with any other school that you're willing to work with. Keep in mind, you're responsible for the software licenses of anything you put behind the product. In other words, we can't go around policing, do you have Microsoft licenses? Do you have VMware licenses? You are responsible for the licenses and the right to share those. Make sense? Okay. Yes. Doesn't that move it into a different AE if you do that? Okay, there's two versions of our product. And I'm going to get to all this, guys. I'm, right now, give me a few minutes and I'll get into the setup environment. That's what I was talking about. You're going to have to multi-process. And I just know techies well enough to know most of you in here, about 90% of you are techies or one one time in your life. So you want to do this stuff. You don't want to listen to me, blah, blah, blah. So that, let's get everybody going in the environment, then I'll cover some more information. All right, now this is lab number two. And again, this is introducing RAID to your student. I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at another lab. I'm going to look at lab number one. And lab number one is what sets up the SAN device, the virtual machine, for the first time. Now, this could be a boring lab for some people, but some folks may really value this lab. How many of you have ever set up a SAN before? Wow. You guys are going to love lab one, then, because you get to set up an open file or SAN. It's kind of cool. So lab one actually walks your student through the process of setting up open filer so they could create a poor man's stand on their own. All right? It's going to take you through the install process to do open filer. So the first lab your student does is actually designed to prepare for the future labs, because it's got to set up their own VM, but they get the right or opportunity to see what it would be like if they wanted to play with Linux and open filer. Pretty cool. You know, especially if you want to set up a poor man's stand down the road sometime. So it takes you step by step installing open filer and walks you through the open filer lab. Okay? Yes. Oh, that's because my um, my lovely lab tech did it as a uh, as a uh, class. So you're set up for a class lecture. So I have to schedule it for you. Give me a second, I'll get you on that lab. All right. Let's see what he did here. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I I don't know how he set it up, so I apologize. Just play with the uh, that, that environment. What you can do is back out of that and go to scheduler. Log, go to my lab. Go to scheduler. Schedule your own lab, and then pick which lab you want to do. Pick lab number one if you would. All right. 
All right. So um, before I move on, those of you who want to play around in the lab environment, you doing okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool stuff. So I'm going to move back to my PowerPoint. Okay, here is the proposed topology for this course. Now, for those of you that think you might want to implement NetLab or you have NetLab today, you might want to pay attention to this proposed topology because it's what we're planning on writing the rest of the labs to. It's got five virtual machines in it. It's got two EMC-based virtual machines, application-based, a SAN, a Windows machine, probably would be Windows Server. We struggle with what Microsoft client to use. We decided to use Windows Server. Um, everybody agree with that pretty good decision for a storage course? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Anybody think it was a bad decision? <laughs> there are so many ways we could have gone. We went with Windows Server. So we went with Linux. Okay, just give me a cursor of you. Those of you that have played around with storage courses in a lab, would this be a pretty good topology in your opinion? Or maybe I should say anyone to jet. Oh, well, well I should actually ask a question. Sure. Uh, what what uh, distro are you looking at for Linux? I, I will be able to answer that. I have that together. It's right in the lab. So I, I can come back to you. Red Hat, maybe. Um, see, I would think they're going to use Red Hat. But there's so many different choices. In fact, I wanted to support a Linux course with NetLab, but that's one of the challenges. Your schools are doing so many different things. Okay, now here's the proposed VM resource requirements. Who in the room knows why this is important? Anybody know why this is really important? We just went over the topology. Why is VM resource requirements a big deal? Yeah, so what happens when I start passing out virtual machines to my students? Resources. There, our friend over here, Kim. We want Kim to help us out. We want to have a nice SAM one day, right? So you want to buy a SAM from Kim's company so you can really scale this thing. But in the short term, you might not be able to get the funds for a SAM. So you might only have host servers. So resource allocation of each VM becomes a really big deal. Also late clones, et cetera. Okay? So that's why we really want to pay attention to what we're doing and setting up for the entire labs. We want to make that footprint on those VMs as small as possible so you can scale to lots of students. Okay, here's proposed application setup. Now we can really get into a lot of details here. Notice we're going to have Wireshark because we're going to introduce the students to some protocol things and some security things as a future lab. But we're thinking this through to the best of our ability. All right, here's an example of the first lab. You might be playing with it. First goal is to install open fire. Makes sense, right? We've got to get a SAM set up in the student pod. So we're going to set up open fire. We're going to play with the passwords. We're going to block devices via Linux client. And then your student is off and ready. This lab is earmarked to take 30 minutes. We figure it in a one hour block of time. If we do it for 30 minutes, Knock on wood, most students will get to it in 45 to 50 minutes. Good logic? That's our logic. Okay. All right. Next lab is an overview of RAID. So our learning objectives create RAID partitions, configure RAID 0, configure RAID 1, configure RAID 5 with hot spare, configure RAID, RAID 10, and then we're off and running. And if you're playing with that lab, you're playing with some of those things. We believe this is a really good lab. Because even if you're not going to be a storage area network expert, you might configure a server and need to have some experience with RAID. Everybody agree? Yeah. Is there anything in the package that tells the students what RAID 1 and 5 is? That's not the instructor that already knows that. The lab exercise itself highlights a few things, but it's not going to make them a RAID expert. Right, but they need to know what the difference is. Yeah, you would want to highlight that as part of your course as you're teaching it. Yeah, like slide bother with RAID 0, for example. Yeah, and in my opinion, that's not a bad thing, though, because it gives the instructor, I mean, you're there for a reason. It gives you some value add to your students as you're working with them. Okay. All right, lab three is an overview of LUNs. Learning objectives create a volume group, create a Windows LUN, create a Linux LUN. Pretty straightforward. Example for lab 4A. Now we're starting to get a little more meat and potatoes. Network attached storage. We're going to create a file system volume, and I'm reading it because I know some folks in the back might not see it. Create share and host access configuration. Set up and enable SMB CIFS. Set up and enable NFS that network file star. Connect Windows client SMB and NFS share. Copy files from Windows clients. Connect Linux client to uh, SMB and NFS share. Copy files from Linux and client. A little more meat and potatoes. It's going to end up being a pretty intense lab. But hopefully they've learned the environment, 
they did they set up a VM on their own, open open filer. You know, they played with two shorter labs. This lab is probably where they come to you and go, I'm not getting it. Can you help me out? Right? You ever heard that? <laughs> well, you can share and mentor with them if you need to. This is then broken into two parts. Then you get into lab 4B, which has not been written. Analyze protocols and performance and network attached storage. That's probably going to be a pretty good lab, especially if you have Cisco cores or you have any kind of networking course. There's going to be a lot of value for a student in that lab. Then we're going to get into the overview of ISO. Then we're going to back up recovery, security vulnerabilities. Very, very applicable topic. Then we're going to get into securing storage infrastructure, managing the storage infrastructure. There's 10 labs mapped to the course. Yes. Do we need anything on FCOE? Uh, it's not planned. Cost. Mucho dinero. Yeah. So like if you're doing wire shark traces, why can't you just have that? You want to write the last one? Or with us? Yeah. That, that was a great question. <laughs> Volunteers, step forward. No, I'm, I'm kidding, kind of a theory. <laughs> I'm kidding, but serious. <laughs> We have an issue right now where I work with the So you're talking about the protocols. It's interesting that you're leaving out one of the main protocols. Well, there's business reasons, and we can talk offline, but one of the challenges yeah. that we're constantly facing is where to invest the dollars, and you have to look at what schools can afford. And that's why we get fiber channel at the time. But I get your point. And, and but for business, I don't know anybody that's not implementing SAM that's not using that COE, especially if they're doing plays. Okay. Feedback is well taken. Yeah. But I can tell you in the first run, we won't invest any, any energy in Fiber Channel, and we can do a supplemental lab at the end of it. But right now, we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, okay. okay. I just know schools aren't going to have it. Um, okay. So that doesn't mean you can't do it. I, I don't disagree with you. It's just where to invest the limited budget is really what it boils down to. All right. Aiming for summer 2012 rollout. So what does that mean? That means if you have a NetLab system for Cisco today, you've implemented VMware, this will be rolled out this summer so that you can go ahead and start using it in your environment and set this up in your environment. Now, does that mean that you've got to wait until then for it? No. We can give anybody in this room access to the labs that you're playing with right now. <coughs> so you can remotely access our system to give us feedback. And then we'll have a pilot period where certain schools that are really excited about this can start piloting the labs before the summer rollout. Why are we aiming for this? Obviously, it's calendar for, for schools. We want to get the word out there in the summer, push it out the system, and then they can start teaching it right at the end of the summer. Okay? Make sense? That's what we're aiming for. All right, setup documentation. If you're interested in this environment, we'll provide you step-by-step -step setup documentation and guides for Cisco, VMware, and the EMC course. So you can follow the cookbook instructions. Anybody that's ever set up a NetLab system, you know, you get all these guidance, and then you can submit a ticket, and we'll answer your questions if you've got questions about the documentation. If you build custom labs on your own, that's where we kind of have to kind of go, uncle, we'll help you if we can, but we'll point you to the documentation for building your own custom labs. And we have 20 some general IT templates. Like if you want to teach a Linux class, you can use those templates. Okay. This is the setup environment. A lot of folks are asking about that. We do all time first. Okay. Is it Okay. So the setup guidance. You need the NetLab server. You need VMware vCenter, which can run on a virtual machine. Please do not run vCenter on your host servers. <laughs> Why? vCenter can be pretty, um, you know, CPU intensive depending on what you're doing. Also, you need to have a separate database. Um, so keep it on a separate, separate team. Is what we recommend. Don't run on the same physical hardware. Then you need your physical servers. Now, when you go to schedule lab time through the interface on the scheduler, what's happening is the NetLab software is talking to vCenter, verifying that your virtual machines are there, and booking the CPU and the RAM resources so that you can start using those computers. Okay? That's what you physically would need to set up this virtual environment. Now, keep in mind, you can still keep your Cisco equipment around. A lot of folks are still using NetLab for Cisco. You can keep that Cisco equipment and marry it to these VMs. Once you're scheduling, you're time sharing the CPU and RAM, like I said, and the way you do that is your NetLab system administrator for each host server defines how many virtual CPUs that server can handle, right? Because you've got to know how much RAM's in there, how much resources. And then 
this NetLab system will never allow that server to become oversubscribed for a specific lab time. Mm -hmm. So if you can only afford one large server, you're okay because you're going to timeshare it. Just bring in your students, right? Let them, let them do it outside the lectures if you have to, so you can scale to the number of students. So do they, do they get um, a message that it's not available? If it's Yes, yeah, they'll get a little pop-up message on the schedule that says that it's booked for that time, and then they just pick the next time. Okay. Yeah. So it basically puts you in a position where you're like a large hosting center, but with very limited small resources. Mm -hmm. So when your time is scheduled, your VMs are pulled off either the local storage, or you can afford to say it, help us out, too. Um, then you'll be able to pull the VMs into that environment, and you're off and running to the races. Okay. Make sense? All right, who's bored? Anyone? One person. Rick Watson. Okay, somebody else is bored, but they want to say it. Okay, once you've got your VMs operating with your students, you can have more than one. For example, in this picture, I got two. This is showing an example where the, the VMware ICM pods are in use. Eight students could be using this first server, while another eight students are using the second. Sixteen students working at the same time. To have a third server, I could have another eight for this course. Well, other courses might not tie up as much resources, so I might be able to run more pods. Okay? So it's generally eight per pod. Well, it's resource driven. Remember that slide I had that showed the resources of the VMs? Well, how much RAM and CPU is going to be eaten by each student as their VMs kick off? And your information specifies that? We document in the setup guide what we believe you could, spec you could do for each system. Okay? Now, I mentioned that you can do a wide variety of courses. We we have partners, Cisco, VMware, EMC. You can do other courses using these general VM templates, okay? You just set them up and run your own VMs. Now, another neat thing that I want to highlight, when you've got your master pod set up for the VMware course, the EMC course, or any general course, you can use this little clone tool, and it will clone the virtual machine and the virtual networks, everything in the drawing, everything will be set up and you can assign it to the student. So it clones it for you, so you don't have to go do it. Once you build your master, you build the master, then you're cloning, you're off the races. Okay, they say I got one minute. All right, there's going to be tons of questions. I'm going to be, I'm going to be here for two days. I'll be here tomorrow, okay? Um, I'll give you a product card if you have it, so you can talk to our techies. You can email our techies. Or you're welcome to schedule a time with me, and I'll be glad to do a WebEx that's geared towards your school. So here's two important email addresses. Mike, and I'm going to put Kim's up here. Uh, yeah, real quick. I have a box of cookies for me and can make it. Um, so I have like a little raffle item, but if you want to give me your business card, I have a few cards with me, but I usually have like a little pamphlet I get about. out. But if you give me your business card, I'll send you a follow-up email, and then you can tell me what you're interested in. Like, if you're interested in one of these course outlines or you want a book, I'll send you like just a follow-up email, and then you can respond saying, yes, I want this or I want that. Probably the easiest way to do it. Um, so, anyhow, so if you do, you can just hand me your card or raise your hand on the way out or whatever, but you put mine, Kim Dot. Kim Dot. Oh, thank you. Kim, if you wrote it down, make sure you put yeah. the dot in the Kim middle. Kim Dot, your hand. And, and, uh, so, but anyways, but if you give me your card, I'll send you, like I said, a follow-up email. I've gotten a few cards, so you can just hand it to me on your way out or whatever. But appreciate you guys coming. Hopefully, you guys got a lot out of it. Um, Some quick feedback. This session... What I want to know is, are these labs of value to your students? Because I don't want to invest in this if it's not. So raise your hands if you have value. Is this a value? Yes. Okay. So I got, I got eight hands. Is that it? Eight schools would actually use this? How much does it cost? You don't have to buy the environment to use it. If you want to run your own environment, you can you can invest in it. NetLab AE is $6,000. $995, and then there's a software upgrade fee to keep all labs current annually, $2395. If you want to do PE, which scales much higher, and you can do more things with it, it's $19,995. Now, but keep in mind, you don't have to buy it. Guys, you can work with other schools that have it in the collaborative effort. Yes? Real quick, so if we have AE and we've been keeping our, our annual services... This will be pushed out of your system automatically. Okay, well, I need to talk to you about that, because i got a problem with that. Okay. Not your problem. It's okay. You can turn it off. You can turn off upgrades. No, no, no. It's something we want to do. Oh, okay. Getting them. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll work with you. Problem. All right. Tomorrow, we've got a session with VMware. We've got a commercial instructor in the back room, Rick Watson. He supports the VMware IT Academy and also trains commercially. 
So he runs commercial courses. He is going to use NetLab to run um, VMware ICM5 Labs, which is the current version of VMware. So if you want to trial that, you might want to attend this session. And thank you all so much for your time. You just send an email after the report. Yes, to me or support at the Yeah, yeah, I'm